The 1980s were defined by conservative politics, materialism, consumerism, the war on drugs, the AIDS crisis, and fear of nuclear war. Despite the chaos, this artist created work that is instantly recognizable, with bright colors, simple cartoonish shapes and figures, and an overall positive energy. His work helped to redefine modern art, while also bringing it to the public. Keith Allen Herring was born on May 4th, 1958 in Reading, Pennsylvania, but lived in Cootstown, Pennsylvania. He was the first child of Allen and Joan Herring, eventually having three younger sisters, Kay, Karen, and Kristen. His mother had early aspirations to become a teacher, but gave it up to focus on raising her children. His father, Allen, was a former U.S. Marine before starting a career with Western Electric. Allen also showed Keith how to draw early on, which became his lifelong passion. Growing up, Herring was drawn to the cartoons and comics of the 1960s, and his own drawings took on a cartoonish style. As a kid, he was briefly involved in the Jesus Movement, which was popular in the 1960s and 70s. Later, he started to hang out with kids who were more into drinking and doing drugs. Herring graduated from Cootstown High School in 1976 and wanted to go to art school. His parents felt that studying commercial art would be the best way to make money as an artist, so he left home to attend the Ivy School of Professional Art in Pittsburgh. He quickly realized that being a commercial artist wasn't what he wanted to do. He also discovered the book The Art Spirit by Robert Henry, which reflected his own feelings about what being an artist meant and inspired him to keep focusing on his own work. After two semesters at the Ivy School, he decided to drop out. At a young age, Herring realized that he was attracted to boys, but his first relationship was with a woman named Susie. Once school had finished, the two took a cross-country road trip that ended in California. In San Francisco, Herring got his first glimpse of the gay scene, something he hadn't seen back in Pennsylvania. After returning to Pittsburgh, Herring found work at the Pittsburgh Arts and Crafts Center, where he took full advantage of the facility, even taking classes in printmaking. In 1977, the Carnegie Institute Museum of Art had a retrospective of artist Pierre Alachinsky that Herring visited multiple times. Alachinsky worked on a large scale, which inspired Herring to do the same. Another inspiration came from a lecture he saw by the artist Christo, who discussed his philosophy on creating public art. The lecture left him wanting to do more to engage the public and have his work seen by everyone. The Arts and Crafts Center was the best way for local artists to have their work shown, and on one occasion, the center had a scheduled show fall through, so Herring was asked to exhibit his work instead. The show was a success, and he considered it to be the first important show of his career. Feeling like it was time for a new start, he left Pittsburgh and his girlfriend behind and headed to New York, where he attended the School of Visual Arts. Herring was an ambitious student, and his work was soon found all around the school. He worked hard on everything he did, and other students were drawn to his friendly personality and positive energy. Here he met fellow artists Kenny Scharf, Drew Straub, and John Sex. And although not a student, he eventually met artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, who did graffiti work around the school. While attending school during the day, Herring explored the gay scene of New York at night, visiting the bathhouses and bars frequently. We work hard, we play hard. The New York club scene was a popular place as well, where he made many friends. In particular, at Club 57, which was in the basement of a church, and the Mud Club, where he later worked. More and more, he found that his interests lay outside of traditional art found in museums. The graffiti art found all around New York was particularly intriguing, and in 1980, he left the School of Visual Arts after feeling that the school had nothing else to offer. While riding the subways to work, Herring noticed black paper panels. When they don't have enough advertisements, they put empty black paper to cancel out the old ad. Um, so I noticed these about 
two and a half years ago on my way through the subway and immediately went above ground and bought some chalk and went back down. He eventually covered the New York subway walls with his drawings. At first, he was only drawing dogs and babies, but worked in other figures over time. One drawing of a flying saucer zapping a baby became a signature of his, known as the Radiant Baby. His simple and unique visual language gave his work universal appeal. One of the earliest shows that he exhibited work in was the Times Square Show in 1980, which featured over a hundred, mostly up-and-coming, artists. He showed his work alongside artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat, Kenny Scharf, and Fab Five Freddy. While gaining exposure with his street art, he also gained attention at the Mud Club after organizing a graffiti show where thousands of graffiti artists showed off their work. By this time, he was selling enough of his drawings to work full-time as an artist. He met artist LA2 after seeing countless tags of his around town. The two would do several collaborations together, and give Herring some street cred as well. Where I come from, street cred is everything! Herring's first long-term relationship was with a man named Juan DeBose, who worked as a DJ. Their relationship was mostly monogamous, Merci. and they eventually moved in together. Herring's work was getting increasingly noticed, and his subway drawings even gained a small following. In 1982, he joined Tony Shafrazi's art gallery, and had his first solo show in October. For the show, he wanted to create large paintings instead of drawings, which he did on tarps. The show was a huge event, with thousands of people in attendance, from many different cultures. His work covered the event from floor to ceiling. The following year, he exhibited at the Fun Gallery, where he showed several works painted on leather. He would also meet artist Andy Warhol during the show, and they quickly became friends. After the success of his solo show, he was invited to Documenta in Germany, followed by shows in Belgium, Japan, and Italy. In Italy, he decided to do his first body painting, and another one followed at a show in London, this one of his friend Bill T. Jones. In December 1983, he had a second solo show in New York, featuring many works done on wood and showcasing his body paintings, with pictures taken by friend and photographer Seng Kwang Chi. After this, he was invited to Australia, where he painted a temporary mural at the Gallery of New South Wales of Sydney, and a permanent mural for Collingwood Technical School in Melbourne. Also in Melbourne, he painted a giant glass water wall at the Melbourne Gallery, the Australian media reported that this work was aboriginal art that had been painted by an American artist. Australians were offended by this, and the work was later destroyed by a person with a gun. Back in the US, he did several murals, as well as workshops with children, which he did as often as possible. Several different projects popped up after this, including a very phallic ad for Absolute Vodka, and a logo for New York's Don't Be a Litter Pig campaign. More shows followed in Italy and Switzerland, where he also did a TV commercial for a store called Big. As his work became more popular, Herring saw many knockoffs of his work, and came up with the idea of the Pop Shop to sell his work and show people what a real Keith Herring looked like. The shop would sell items for serious collectors as well as casual customers. Some commercial projects he did included watch designs, a curtain for the ballet The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, and the set for the ballet Secret Pastures. A double show was done in 1985, with paintings at the Tony Shafrazi Gallery and giant sculptures at the Leo Castelli Gallery. In the mid-1980s, the AIDS virus had changed everything about gay culture worldwide, as the virus disproportionately affected gay men as well as minorities, immigrants, and intravenous drug users. Herring addressed serious topics like AIDS, the crack epidemic, apathy in Africa, and the Michael Stewart slaying of 1983 in his signature cartoon style. By 1985, Herring had become an internationally famous artist, and he hung out with celebrities like Madonna, Michael Jackson, Paul Rubens, and Brooke Shields. His birthday parties had thousands of people in attendance. This fame became too much for his partner Juan DeBose, and their relationship ended. But soon, a new Juan began with Juan Rivera. 
That's the joke. His next show took him to France, where he painted 10 arches with a Ten Commandments theme. In 1986, he had a show at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, where he painted another giant outdoor mural, as well as a smaller indoor mural, and giant cloth below the museum's skylight. After that, he was asked to paint a section of the Berlin Wall, which he painted with an interlocking chain of people, representing unity against the wall. This work was quickly painted over by other artists, who took issue with the colorful work. One of his largest murals, called City Kids Speak on Liberty, was also created this year, where 1,000 kids filled in their answers to the question, what does liberty mean to you? In 1987, Andy Warhol died while Herring was on vacation in Brazil. The two had become close friends, and Herring was affected greatly. After attending Warhol's funeral in New York, he returned to Europe. He exhibited at the Pompidou Center Beauberg Museum and Daniel Templon Gallery in Paris, followed by a mural at the Necker Children's Hospital. At another stop in Munich, he took part in Luna Luna, a traveling amusement park with designs done by a wide range of artists. In Belgium, he had exhibitions at Gallery 121, as well as the Kanoke Casino, where he also painted a permanent mural inside of the casino, and another mural at the Channel Surf Club. His next projects were a collaboration with writer William S. Burroughs, whom Herring was a fan of. The first was a series of ten prints called Apocalypse, followed by a series of etchings called The Valley. He created more murals in 1988, including one at the annual White House Easter Egg Roll. After reading a book about the effects of AIDS, Herring decided to check himself for purple splotches, and found one on his leg. He tested positive for KS, Kaposi's sarcoma, which commonly affects people with weakened immune systems. Another test revealed that his T-cell count had dropped, which now confirmed that he had AIDS. He took drugs to prolong his life, but ultimately, there was, and still is, no cure. AIDS had taken the lives of many of Herring's friends, and his work focused more on activism and raising awareness. He was more driven than ever to create as much art as he could in the limited time he had left. After his diagnosis, Herring ended his relationship with Juan Rivera, and spent more and more time with Gil Vasquez. Vasquez was straight, but gave Herring the emotional support that he needed. Jean-Michel Basquiat died from a heroin overdose this same year, prompting the painting, A Pile of Crowns for Jean-Michel Basquiat. He finished the year with a show in Germany featuring large sculptures, and a show back in New York where he painted on raw canvas. In 1989, Herring's former partner, Juan de Bose, died from AIDS. His friends John Sex and Quang Chi also tested HIV positive. Following Debose's funeral, Herring and Vasquez took a long vacation in Europe, during which he painted his first AIDS mural in Barcelona. Back in the US, he did a 520 foot long mural where kids were asked to color in his line work. A documentary was made about this event. Another mural was done in Chicago and Iowa City before he left for Paris to paint a blimp and Pisa, Italy for another mural. Following more projects and sightseeing in Europe, he returned with Gill to LA, where they partied with celebrities. An article in Rolling Stone came out in August, which tells Herring's life story and revealed his AIDS diagnosis to the world. In November, he took his parents to Europe, where he also had an exhibition in Germany. In December, he painted a mural for AIDS Awareness Day at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena later returning to Germany, where he painted a BMW. When he returned to New York this time, his health began deteriorating. He tried out different drugs, but by early 1990, he was often too weak to do anything. He developed laryngitis, which made it hard to speak. Doctors and nurses visited him daily, and support came constantly from phone calls and visitors. Despite all efforts, Keith Haring died on February 16, 1990, at the age of 31. A memorial was held, and his ashes were spread in Cootstown, Pennsylvania, where he grew up. On May 4th, what would have been Herring's 32nd birthday, a memorial was held in New York, attended by more than a thousand people. His final painting, more than likely, was The Last Rainforest, 
which depicts a somewhat horrific scene of plants and animals in a jungle, and the radiant baby in the middle of it all, depicted in the lotus position. The painting known as Unfinished Painting was intentionally unfinished. It may not have actually been his last painting, but represents the millions of lives cut short by the AIDS epidemic. Although his career only lasted about 10 years, his accomplishments were unparalleled. He created more than 50 public works around the world, with many works being created to help nonprofits, hospitals, daycare centers, and orphanages. Some of his public works are still on display in their original location today, and free to visit. His paintings, though, sell for millions of dollars. In 2017, his painting, Untitled, sold at a Sotheby's auction for $6 million, and his work and iconic symbols can be found on a wide range of products today. The Keith Haring Foundation was established by Haring himself in 1989, and according to its website, its mission is to sustain, expand, and protect the legacy of Keith Haring, his art, and his ideals. In addition to maintaining archives of Herring's work, the Foundation continues his philanthropic legacy by providing grants to children in need and those affected by HIV AIDS. So what do you think about Herring's work? How do you feel about his approach to very real and relevant topics? And with so many different projects, are there any that maybe I didn't talk about that should have been mentioned? Any thoughts you have on this artist, please let me know in the comments. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please support this channel by liking and subscribing.